Best case ever. Best case ever. We're going to do something a little bit different for this best case ever. Rather than discuss a topic in anticipation of a main episode podcast, we're going to hear a best case ever on a topic that we've recently covered in one of the main episode podcasts. And here at EMC Studios, it's my pleasure to welcome to the show Dr. Alicia Targonsky, currently a full-time ED doc at North York General Hospital, who's a contributor to the up-and-coming EM Cases Quiz Vault that'll be released this fall 2018, and who is the only physician in history to score a perfect score on the EM Cases course Sweat Like a Medical Student End of Course Test. And here's the brilliant Dr. Targonsky with his best case ever. Thank you, Anton, for inviting me to the show. And uh, I just have to say thank you for the, the kind words and introduction. And I've been a longtime listener for probably seven years since your inception of the show. So this was a really memorable case for me. And I think it kind of reflects all the struggles we go through with these types of patients. And to start things off, I was the 6 a.m. doctor, so the early morning shift, and I was getting handover from the overnight doc on a patient he had seen with some right-sided back sort of flank periscapular pain. And this is one of our excellent docs, so I trust his assessments really, 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 really well. She was seen at the Janus General Hospital Emerge one or two years ago. The handover went something like this. This is a 40-year-old lady, recently found out that she's pregnant, but she doesn't know her dates and doesn't know her uh, last menstrual period. I think she's probably having MSK-type pain, but she was complaining of pain in the right back area, just under the scapula. Her exam is normal, except for some pretty impressive tenderness just underneath the scapula. Her urine is negative. Her routine blood work and LFTs are normal. ECG was normal. Troponin done by medical directive was also normal. She's not sure of her dates. I think it's just muscular, but I've put her in for ultrasound to be done in the morning and a repeat LFTs. I'm hoping that we'll find something, maybe renal colic, maybe gallstones, but we'll see. And I think if it's all normal, you could probably send her home as a muscular type pain. The only thing is though, that we gave her some Tylenol and it didn't quite help so much. So she did need a bit of morphine. All right. Yeah, there's a red flag there, eh? I mean... Yeah, there's patients with MSK pain that require morphine sometimes, but yeah, as soon as they start requiring morphine, that's when I kind of raise my eyebrows, you know, could this be something else? So so what were you thinking at this point? So at this point, I'm thinking most handovers, I probably uh, just wait for the nurse to call me with the results that are finished or if there's any uh, issues that come up. And then once all the pending investigations are back, I'll go see the patient and usually discharge them home or refer to the appropriate service based on the, the plans from the, uh, the, the previous doctor. Sure. But on this one, I thought, this is a pregnant patient, so there's a bit of risk there. It's a handover, so there's some risk there. And as you've covered in previous episodes, handovers can be high risk. So I was thinking to myself, I should probably go see this patient. And also, it happened to be a very light day in the morning, so I thought I've got the time to spare. I should go back and get the story for myself. So I went back to see the patient and I, uh, and I obtained a, you know, a fresh history and physical with my differential diagnosis in mind at this point. At that point, I'm thinking, okay, this could be anything from renal colic, pyelonephritis. It could be biliary colic or cholecystitis. It could be pneumonia. It could be a PE. It could be just muscular pain. Maybe it's shingles. So I'm thinking about all the things I'm going to ask and, uh, and look for when I go see this patient. So I reviewed the history, and as mentioned before, she complained of some right-sided back pain just underneath the uh, the scapula. It may have been pleuritic, but not clearly so. It came on unprovoked and fairly acutely, and it it was bad enough that she actually had a hard time even sitting back on her chair or laying flat. So I asked about shortness of breath, and she had none, including exertional shortness of breath. She had no problems climbing the stairs or anything. And asked about feeling like she might faint or some central chest pain, pain that radiated to her extremities. Certainly nothing to go on with that. There was no trauma, no recent heavy lifting that might suggest it was clearly a muscular problem. And she had no fever, dysuria, hematuria, any urinary tract symptoms, no cough, no hemoptysis, and certainly no history of gallstones or kidney stones. So at this point, I'm thinking there really isn't a whole lot to go on here. It's just isolated back pain in that one spot. All right. So, so far, you really got nothing to hang your hat on. I mean, 
it kind of seems MSK, the only, again, the red flag there is that they're requiring morphine. So your spidey sense is up for something else going on. And I would think that on physical exam, you'd really be able to nail down whether this was MSK or not. What was the physical exam like? So I walked into the physical exam, certainly hoping I was going to find something that would slam dunk a diagnosis and make it a lot easier. I reviewed the vital signs. They were all normal during her stay, including at at triage and since she had arrived in the department. She looked well, maybe a bit anxious, and she had a hard time sitting down in the chair. As I mentioned, she was saying that anytime she sat or lay back, she she had a, a worse pain in her back. Cardiovascular exam was unremarkable chest was clear, although I thought maybe there was some diminished breath sounds in the right base, and her abdomen was soft, non-tender, no CVA tenderness, negative Murphy sign. I looked at her legs, could not find anything suggestive of a DVT, and I was hoping I would find a rash of shingles around the scapula, but there was nothing there. But I should mention that she was exquisitely tender when I pushed on the muscles just underneath her scapula. So I hadn't really gotten any further ahead than what the handover note was from the previous doctor. And then I reviewed all the labs. The ECG was totally normal. The beta HCG was in keeping with uh, first trimester pregnancy. The urine sample, not even a hint of hematuria. And her LFTs were all normal. So after my assessment, I said to the patient, let's see what the ultrasound and the blood work show. If it's all negative, we should probably consider some alternative diagnoses, for example, PE or pneumonia, although this could all just be muscular because you're quite sore there. So I do agree, for the most part, with the assessment from the doc who saw you overnight. Fair enough. So at this point, I'm uh, sort of desperately hoping that something is going to show up on the ultrasound, because in my mind, I just really don't want to be working up a PE in a pregnant patient, And I don't want to be exposing her to potentially tests that might be harmful. Even though chest x-rays has minimal amount of radiation, I feel like we're going down that pathway. There's a little voice talking to me saying, this is not just muscle. And at this point, I'm also thinking in my head, what is going to be my algorithm if the ultrasound shows nothing, the LFTs are normal, and I'm back at square one? How am I going to continue to work this patient up? I remember reading an article from Jeff Klein and his colleagues from a number of years ago where they talked about using modified D-dimer cutoffs in patients who are otherwise PERC negative if you exclude the factor of pregnancy. So I don't remember all the details of the study, but I was thinking maybe if she's PERC negative, which she is as I'm looking at her vital signs, I could get away with a D-dimer. And if it's negative, maybe we've closed the book on the whole issue for PE. A couple hours later, the ultrasound comes back. And what do you think the ultrasound showed? Negativo. And what do you think the LFTs showed? Perfectly normal. You're absolutely right. So here I'm sweating. I'm thinking to myself, oh, no, I think I need to open the book on PE. So I said to her, I'm going to order a test called the D-dimer, and I'm going to get a chest X-ray. If the D-dimer is normal and the chest X-ray shows something like looking like a pneumonia, we will treat you as a pneumonia. If the D-dimer is positive, then we have to think about pursuing the pulmonary embolism diagnosis. And I explained to her what that was. In the meantime, we're going to send you for a three-minute walk test, which is something I get my nurses to do for some patients to see if the oxygen levels go down or the heart rate goes up. She seemed on board with that plan, so I ordered the test. I'm not sure how many of your listeners use it, But I know that Ian Steele's group in Ottawa has published a little bit on this topic, looking at CHF and COPD patients. But they did do a study on PE patients that showed if the heart rate went up by 10 beats per minute or the O2 sat went down by, I believe it was 2% or more, that had some value in patients with possible PE. Yeah, I find the walk test really valuable. I know in Ottawa, they use it on like everyone with a chest, uh, but I've been using it more and more recently. And... I find that it's especially helpful in those patients who you think are probably fine to go home. They have normal vital signs at rest, and they've got shortness of breath that you're just not sure about. Send them on a walk test, and lo and behold, I've been surprised dozens of times with patients who have perfectly normal vitals at rest, and then suddenly they drop their SAT to 87% uh, when you walk them around the, the department. So I find that walk test actually really helpful. I agree 100%. So I left the room thinking what any normal, sane emergency doctor would think. 
oh God, please let this be a normal walk test. And I'm hoping the D-dimer is negative and the chest x-ray is either totally normal or it shows a clear infiltrate that looks like pneumonia. Because I really, really don't want to be ordering a CT on this patient. Yeah, I'm, I'm sensing maybe some abnormal tests coming up here. So 15 minutes later, the nurse comes up to me and says, so remember that patient? Her oxygen sat went down to 88%. And I thought to myself, oh crap. So an hour later, I get my D-dimer back. It's 2100. And at this hospital, the cutoff is 500. So well above the normal. And the chest x-ray shows a small right-sided infiltrate that looks a bit like a pneumonia. And I've seen infarcts on chest x-rays before that look a lot like pneumonia. And as you covered in your previous uh, PE episode, chest x-ray in pulmonary embolism will sometimes show something that looks a bit like a pneumonia. So I called the radiologist for a second opinion, just to, hoping he would tell me, oh, that's clearly pneumonia. And he unfortunately could not do that. So again, I'm back to the drawing board thinking about PE. The situation didn't have a cough. They didn't have a fever. They didn't really say they were short of breath. So they really had no features of pneumonia, eh? No, not really. I went back to the patient at this point and I said, PE is really still on the table, very much so. So the plan at this point in my algorithm was to obtain Dopplers, venous Dopplers of the, of the legs, looking for a clot. Because if we find a clot in the legs, we're done. If it's negative, unfortunately, we're dealing with a CT and not a VQ because she's got an abnormal chest x-ray at this point. Two hours later, Dopplers come back. And what do you think the result is? Negativo. Again, negative. So I'm thinking to myself, she either embolized everything that's there or there's something else sitting in, in her pelvic veins, maybe in the iliacs, uh, which we know pregnant patients can be a little bit higher risk for. Then the husband said to me, what about her low blood pressure? I said, low blood pressure? What are you talking about? And he told me, after the nurse gave morphine since I had last seen her, the blood pressure dropped a little bit. And at this point, my brain is really clicking, thinking, stop trying to avoid working up this PE. You know it's a PE. Just get the test. So I told the patient, I really think we need to get a CT scan. We need to rule out a pulmonary embolism. Okay, that, that's a tough conversation. So how did that conversation go? So I tried to approach it in a shared decision-making way. I told the patient and her husband, look, we're dealing with something that's not your muscle anymore because muscle pain does not make your oxygen levels go down when you're walking around. So this is either a PE or a pneumonia. And really the best way to differentiate that is a CAT scan. That being said, CAT scans do carry some risk. And in a pregnant patient, the main risk to you is, is that your risk of breast cancer may go up in the future due to developing breast tissue and you're young and the, rate, the CT scan carries a fair amount of radiation. But missing a PE in someone who's pregnant may have catastrophic consequences. So I highly recommend doing the CT scan. At this point, though, the patient and her husband are still a little bit hesitant to, to carry out the, the CT scan. So I came up with a kind of middle ground compromise. I approached our internal medicine colleagues and I said, this patient needs to come in. If she has a PE, it's a big one. And if she has a pneumonia, it's a pretty substantial one, even though the x-ray is not really showing a whole lot there. So can you admit her, treat her for both, and then when she finally comes around, we'll get the CT scan? And fortunately, my medicine colleagues were agreeable to that. So about half an hour later, when they came back from seeing her, the internist said, the patient is willing to do the CT. So of course I ordered the CT. And also of course, this is the end of my shift. I've been dealing with this handover for eight hours, <laughs> working up what I think is a PE. So, oh, so you saw a total of like four patients that shift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know those shifts where the handovers are the most of your work? Oh yeah. Um, so I, I went home after I ordered the CT scan and on my drive home, I'm thinking, I really hope this patient does not have an unnecessary CT scan and I've exposed them to some risk. But on the other hand, I think I had a reasonable, sensible approach to working up this patient. Absolutely. So the next day I found out from the doc who had seen her the night before, I got a text message saying, she ended up having a bilateral moderate burden PE with evidence of right heart strain on the CT scan. So unfortunately for the patient, it was it's a bad diagnosis. But for me, I was thinking, I'm glad I pursued the diagnosis. I'm glad I ignored the biases that were, I think, ingrained in, in me and all of us 
it was a reminder that, you know, we need to treat pregnant patients just like anybody else. And if there's a serious diagnosis, I think we need to pursue that, even if there is potential harm with some of the tests we do. Yeah, I've been in so many situations, and it's not only with the eMERGE docs, but also with other consultants where no one wants to touch the pregnant patient. Whatever that fear comes from, I think it's important for all of us to really step forward and treat these patients the way they should be treated, just like any other patient. In this case, just like any other patient who you're trying to work up for a PE, especially considering that pregnancy is a risk factor for PE. So, Dr. Tardonsky, what did you learn from this case? I mean, there's there's so many great learning points. Number one is that it's it's really important to review the history and physical in a patient who's handed over to you, especially a pregnant patient, because handovers are high risk, pregnant patients are high risk, and I think it's important to avoid biases like anchoring or diagnostic momentum, which are easy pitfalls to fall into when you receive a handover. Yeah. I mean, sometimes when I get that handover and I'm just not quite sure... And I, for whatever reason, I didn't challenge the person who was handing it over in the first place. I usually find it best just to start from scratch again. And I'll also refer patients to uh, episode 99, which was uh, highlights of EMU 2017, where Chris Hicks talked about a really nice, clean, airtight outline for how to hand over a patient to minimize risk, really, for that risky situation. The other thing I took away from this is that pulmonary embolism can present in a very atypical way. And maybe this is even more so in pregnant patients. This patient had no shortness of breath. She didn't even have anterior chest pain. She had back pain. It was thoracic pain, but it was back pain. And she had exquisite tenderness on her physical exam, which would really suggest that this was muscular. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tricky one because you got to wonder what the specificity of muscular tenderness is in terms of ruling in a muscular cause. I know that uh, for cardiac ischemia, the numbers are somewhere in the 30% range in terms of the percentage of patients with MI who will have chest wall tenderness. You know, chest wall tenderness can be one of those things that's certainly misleading. What about PE? Do you know any numbers in terms of the percentage of patients who have chest wall tenderness who rule in for PE? So I know that from my own experience, I have seen patients with chest wall tenderness with a PE, but I happened after this case to look up to see what the numbers are. And I found an article back in BMJ in 2005. The author was Legal, and they showed that in a cohort of patients with chest wall pain that was reproducible on exam, 20% of these patients had a pulmonary embolism, which was the same number of patients who had a pulmonary embolism as those patients who did not have any chest wall tenderness at all. So one in five patients with chest wall tenderness, at least in this cohort, had a pulmonary embolism. And on top of the atypicality of uh, PE presentation, chest x-rays will sometimes show an infiltrate, which is so easy to mistake for pneumonia. Yeah, and good for you for taking the time to actually review the x-ray with a radiologist. I find, you know, in this particular case, it wasn't very helpful, but sometimes the radiologist will say, you know what, that actually doesn't look like an infiltrate. I'd be worried about an infarct in that case. The other thing is scrutinizing the vital signs. For me, I, I missed a short period of time between reassessments where the blood pressure actually had dipped down a little bit. And thankfully, the patient told me themselves that the blood pressure had dropped. But uh, it's really important to scrutinize vitals. And on top of that, to not overlook the utility of the walk test, because I think the walk test is really what tipped me over over the edge into really thinking that this patient had a serious, serious uh, chance of having a pulmonary embolism. So Dr. Targonsky, the kind of algorithm that you went through was basically PERC, D-dimer, chest X-ray, Doppler legs, CT, which is a perfectly reasonable algorithm. Based on what we discussed in the main episode podcast, we know that most patients who are pregnant are excluded from PE diagnostic studies. And so there's really no good evidence for any algorithm. But one of the algorithms that's very close to what you did that we recommend is the one from the CADTH March 2018 paper entitled Optimal Strategies for the Diagnosis of Acute Pulmonary Embolism Recommendations. And that's what we talked about in the main episode podcast. And it basically involves five steps. They suggest starting with the two-tiered wells, which this patient would have been low risk for sure. Then you apply the PERC. 
If the perk's positive, you get a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is less than 500, you're done. And as you said, there are some experts who recommend trimester-adjusted D-dimer, adding 250 for each trimester. But I don't think the evidence is quite there yet. And it's also important to remember that the American Thoracic Society recommends not using a D-dimer at all in pregnancy. So it's still a bit controversial, but it makes sense that in someone who's low risk, who has a negative D-dimer, whether they're pregnant or not, that it's extremely unlikely that they'll have a PE. And that's bore out in some literature. The observational studies do show 100% sensitivity for D-dimer in pregnancy. Then the next step would be uh, Doppler legs. And as you said, if you find a DVT on the leg Dopplers, you're, you're done, you treat. If you don't, that's when you need to go on to CTPA or a VQ SPECT. And if you have access to VQ SPECT, it's a lot better than the old school VQ scans that we used to get. It gives you a yes or no dichotomous answer. And uh, especially in patient who has a normal chest X-ray and a patient who's worried about breast tissue radiation, then a VQ scan would certainly be a reasonable option. The other time to think about a VQ SPECT is in a patient who has a severe allergy to IV contrast for the CT. So I think that it's a great example of biases that we often have of really understanding what we have evidence for and what we don't have evidence for, and also the importance of good shared decision-making in the ED and taking your time with these complex patients. Thanks, Dr. Targonsky, for your amazing case. Yeah, well, I hope the listeners get something out of this case too. Thanks, Anton. (laughs) 